710 somewhere, and right now that somewhere is right here. That's right, all heads, I'm looking at you this episode. Hello and welcome to The Cannabis Show. My name, Producer Vince, and here's your host, Ricardo Baca. Producer Vince, it is 710 somewhere, yeah, surely, man. especially with one of our guests today. I thought so. Oh my gosh, very apt. Thank you for that introduction and to everybody joining us today at the Cannabis Show. Welcome to the studio where we talk about all things weed. Hashtag all things weed. That is the serious cannabis news and the fun stuff as well. Uh, in fact, if you pop onto the Cannabis right now, you can read stories about the DEA's assertion that the media is making it tough to put people in jail for marijuana. Government agencies using the press as a scapegoat, y'all. Oh, man. And also, we have our review up of the new Viceland series, Bong Appetit. And our critic is a fan. And our other critic is a host. Oh, that's true. <laughs> We're about to welcome him out here. And also, check out our list of marijuana life hacks. They might just save the day for you at some point in the near future. You never know. I need to look at this still. I don't have anything to say about it. I hope there's an infograph. <laughs> Producer Vince, man, how are you? You know, I'm pretty well, Ricardo. Thank you for asking. It's getting cold. It's getting wonderful here. We're getting ready for the end of the year holidays. There's social gatherings everywhere, and I've never felt more popular. How have you been, Ricardo? You've never, you've never <laughs> felt more popular? Yeah, it's weird. People in Denver actually want to hang out with me. It's kind of a cool social scene here. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, welcome to Denver. Uh, more than a year after you moved here, Vince. Uh, what, two? years? Uh, three year anniversary was two weeks ago actually so I'm starting my third year here with the post in the cannabis. Ah, okay okay well <laughs> good everything on this end is good and busy I'm psyched for the holiday I've really enjoyed the uh, the holiday parties I've been to so far been to some good weed industry stuff some family friends stuff looking forward to some more catching up with good people it's what the season's all about right but uh, hey Vince I think it's time to jump right into the weekend weed First, I need to know, Vince, from you, if you're actually ready for this weekend weed, because we're going to do some globe trotting here in the next couple minutes. Globe trotting sounds athletic. <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, I'm in. Let's do it, dude. Sweet. Weekend weed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are starting this weekend weed on the East Coast, Massachusetts in particular. Uh, and Vince, something very exciting is happening in Massachusetts this week. Any idea what it is? They are all celebrating, officially knocking the Broncos out of the playoff contention and me not having to travel this postseason at all. <laughs> That's my guess. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know, the Patriots are in Denver on Sunday. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We'll see what happens there. But actually, in Massachusetts, check this out, as of December 15th, Cannabis is recreational legal in the Bay State. Woohoo! Uh, while the sales won't start for at least another year, it's already legal for you to grow, consume, and possess marijuana in the state of Massachusetts. And that is a wicked important first step in the legalization process. Last month, the voters said, hey, we, uh, we kind of want this. And now the lengthy implementation process will actually begin. Oh, and lengthy it is. You know, we've, of course, been through this in Colorado, Washington, all the other states. Uh, you know, it's a process. In Colorado, we voted in November of 2012. Uh, our governor signed it into the Constitution that December, just one month later. But we had to wait another 12 and a half months for that implementation process. Uh, you know, so it is lengthy. There's a lot of interesting things about to start happening in the lawmaking, the rulemaking, the regulatory writing process in Massachusetts. But this is kind of the first step of getting there. Yeah, man. And uh, luckily, they had the Colorado model to kind of follow because this could sound familiar. Here are the specifics of Massachusetts' weed economy as of December 15th. You may possess up to an ounce of marijuana. You may grow up to six plants for personal use or up to 12 plants. I tried to hold up the fingers. That doesn't work. Per household <laughs> if you have two adults living there. And you may give away up to an ounce of cannabis to another adult so long as no money, no money at all, is changing hands. And that includes you, Craigslisters, We're out there you, with Craigslist. your donations. <laughs> we know that's not legal. You know that's not legal, but you're going to do it anyway. So Fact. go ahead and learn your own <laughs> lessons. Uh, it sounds very familiar, but moving on elsewhere in the weekend weed, right in our own backyard, actually, we are starting to see what a more developed recreational marijuana economy looks like years down the line. And when you, Ricardo, wrote about these latest pox tax and figure, sales figures earlier this week, I could not believe what I was reading. You know, I, I was surprised when it first came up, but here is the literal money shot 
In the first 10 months of 2016, Colorado marijuana shops sold $1 billion in legal regulated cannabis. Check that out. $1 billion. And I have to shout out to all of our Twitter followers, but specifically the one who had the right reaction, that Dr. Evil impression. I've watched Austin <laughs> Powers twice this week since that announcement now because of you. Thank you. But actually, Ricardo, what we saw was more than nearly $1.1 billion of pot sales through October. And there are still two more months to go before this year, 2016, whatever it is, is actually over. Oh my gosh, I think so many of us are ready for 20, <laughs> 2016 to be done with. But you know, those year-end sales numbers for 2016, they'll likely settle around the $1.3 billion number. That's for Colorado, of course. But perhaps the more interesting figure here is the marijuana tax revenues. So I spoke with an economist earlier this week, and he's confident that 2016's pot taxes will actually amount to more than 2014 and 15 cannabis tax revenues combined. All right, the pained look on my face is because math. So in the first <laughs> 10 months of 2016, those taxes are already at the $151 million mark, including $40 million earmarked for school construction projects. So if this year's taxes total more than $184 million, then they will beat the two previous years combined, which is <laughs> a word I can't use on my own show, insane. <laughs> it is insane, dude. Oh my word. It's a lot of money. It's interesting to see these tax revenues uh, start to pile up, and we're going to be reporting more on that this week. Yeah, we Looking are. Looking forward to telling you some more interesting facets about what's happening. But elsewhere in the weekend weed, the Pantone Color Institute team announced its 2017 Color of the Year. And it might be a familiar one to anyone watching or listening <laughs> to us right now. You know, when I first saw the announcement itself, colorblind me went, all right, whatever. But then I, you know, dug in and I was like, cool, it's a green color. But then I saw the name and I was victim of branding because it was immediately Okay, that's rad. I'm in. Let's talk about oh, this, bro. Yes. It's cool. And the <laughs> Pantone color of the year is greenery. Yeah, it is. Uh, Vince will show it off right now. Check it out. Uh, well, greenery is, of course, the, the color of weed. Uh, the selection was hardly a nod to legalization's big year moving forward. And I want to point out to everybody that on this show, I've been wearing the color of the year, at least featuring it, you know predominantly for 91 episodes <laughs> here. But I must quote our own style columnist, Katie Shapiro, who wrote about the selection, quote, marijuana is greenery and greenery, greenery is marijuana. Greenery symbolizes medicine. Greenery symbolizes growth. Greenery symbolizes money, symbolizes justice, and greenery symbolizes progress, end quote. Man. There you go, K. Shapiro. Reads like a poem when you read it. <laughs> Katie's words and Vince's interpretation. <laughs> uh, there you go. And finally, here is our colleague Alicia Wallace with this week's Quick Hit. In Justin Trudeau's bid last year to become Canada's prime minister, the Liberal Party leader said he would, quote, legalize, regulate, and restrict access to marijuana. Flashing forward to this week, a Prime Minister Trudeau-led parliament was handed extensive direction on just how to accomplish that. The nine-member Task Force on Marijuana Legalization and Regulation delivered and made public its hefty report outlining roughly seven dozen recommendations for legal marijuana in Canada. We have a look at those suggestions in the full report on thecannabis.co, but some of the key highlights include a minimum purchase age of at least 18, home grow limits of four plants that can be no higher than three feet three inches, mail order delivery in addition to shops, childproof packaging, the potential for cannabis clubs, penalties for trafficking and impaired driving, decriminalization for minor offenses, a dedication to research, and maintaining a separate medical marijuana framework. For The Cannabis, I'm Alicia Wallace with this week's Quick Hit. Thank you, Alicia. Now, it is time to bring out our first guest, who is one of our colleagues here at The Cannabis, but perhaps you'll also recognize him from his new gig as co-host of Bong Appetit, debuting on Viceland on December 14th. It is very much my pleasure to welcome my friend, Rye Pritchard, to The Cannabis Show. Hey! Yo! Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too, Always. man. Welcome back to town. Thank you. You were in L.A. for how long? That was about five weeks. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, we, uh, many more questions about getting away for that <laughs> length of time when you're as busy as you are. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> uh, first, dry. Indica and sativa, 
We've had this conversation, but remind me, and, and maybe it's changed. So where are you at on the spectrum? I'm more of a sativa guy, especially in terms of that traditional effect. I, I like being productive. I like being a little more up, a little more clear-headed. So, yep. Which always. is interesting, because I yeah. always think, you, think of you as very up, very, uh, you know, kind of stream of consciousness. There is you a know, reason for you're, that. You're a fast <laughs> talker, so maybe I always just assume that as part of your personality, but, or maybe it's just that you're stoned. Maybe it's just sativa dabs. <laughs> yep, sativa dabs, that's it. All yep. right, props to the sativa first, <laughs> because, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, also, congrats on the TV show. Thank you, man. I am so happy for you, so proud of you. You guys created something great. Uh, before we get to the TV show, though, First, I want to ask you about Terp Quest. Yes. <laughs> Dude, Rye, I've, been, I've known you for three plus years now, follow you on all the social media. I always see a hashtagging stuff, Terp Quest, and it's, yeah. sometimes it's a fine dining meal, sometimes it's some gorgeous amber concentrate, but uh, you know, I, I know through talking to you that Terp Quest is your own food, drink, cannabis pairing project, mm -hmm. but tell us, what is Terp Quest, and also uh, tell me how it ultimately led you to this Viceland uh, show. Well, um, TerpQuest, uh, I've thrown a couple parties under that banner, but um, really TerpQuest is a project trying to bring food and beverage together with cannabis in the most interesting ways. Um, you know, whether that's a pairing, whether that's an infusion, whether it's, you know, a, a social combination of the two. Um, I, I just think the same obsession that people feel with, with beer, with wine, with coffee, with, um, you know, food, with an amazing steak, with any of these things, um, that, that level of passion translates directly to cannabis. And sure. so people that are cannabis people understand that innately, but all these chefs and, and, and others are just starting to you know, be awakened to that. So, Especially um, given that this is almost a new set of flavor profiles. Not new, but it's new to many of the chefs and it's new to a whole host of diners, right, who have never really contemplating having access to this in their food. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, with the pairings, it's such a deep way to pair things because you're not only pairing, you know, the flavor or the aroma or whatever, but you're pairing the, the experience. Um, you know, you can kind of take people on a journey, an up and down sort of thing throughout the course of a, you know, multi-course three-hour meal um, yeah. and it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think we all have experienced or experimented in our own homes you know hey we're all ho hosting a dinner party having friends over let's start with this maybe take it there but um, you know tell me about the one of your trip quest events and then also how did this lead to uh, to bong appetit on Viceland <laughs> Well, um, so, you know, uh, w one of the events I did was a very simple one, but it's a very good way to explain the concept. So um, we did uh, with a local chef here, Ian Kleinman, who, you know, of the Inventing Room, he recently got, got moved out of his spot un due to unfortunate circumstances. So oh, geez, but okay. he's an amazing, amazing chef. Um, we did an event where he made some liquid nitrogen um, sorbets that were all made from cold pressed juices. Um, and so he made a selection of six different sorbets and we paired them with dabs. Um, so, you know, the idea, Wow. is you know you you take a dab to get a baseline and then you take a bite of the sorbet then you take a second dab and it and the sorbet modifies the way that you process that second hit and also having the first one on your palate changes the way you affect the, the, the sorbet affects you, you know, and, and hits your palate. So you can have this beautiful blending of flavors in, you know, in a, a 15 second segment. And the second dab is a different concentrate. No, the same one. So same one, yeah, okay. so, so we, so we make the pairing, it. yeah, we make the pairings very intentional so that it, it interplays on both sides. Oh, nice, um, okay. Yeah. And so obviously you found your way to uh, these producers behind this new Viceland show. <laughs> yeah, so um, I mean, it was funny. Uh, my my friend is is a consulting producer on the show. He's basically responsible for figuring out how to do all all the weed stuff, you know, in, in terms of where it actually comes from and how you actually do that. So he he brought me in early on in the process um, to try to do Terp Quest as an episode because he thought that the pairings and the flavor centric ness of Terp Quest was very appropriate um, because most of the people they had talked to at that point were talking about infusions rather than flavor pairings. Um, so that's what really started the initial conversations with Vice and then um, it quickly progressed to them needing another person for the show that will actually be on camera. So, Dude, yeah. and, and you definitely <laughs> became that person. You're co-hosting, you're the marijuana infusions expert. <laughs> uh, but tell us about this the central ideas be behind Bong Appetit. I was surprised that 
they shared so much, or at least they appeared to share so much with the uh, central philosophy behind Terp Quest. So what did you and the team exactly hope to accomplish with this show? Well, um, so I mean, my job on the, I guess I'll rewind a little bit. The show itself is a 10 episode cooking show. Um, it's on Viceland, or it's on Vice's cable channel, Viceland. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was to make a food centric show. Um, you know, cannabis isn't necessarily the focus. It's really supposed to be the food. Um, and the idea is to get chefs who may or may not have ever cooked with cannabis to make the most insane, highbrow, amazing, multiple infusion type of cannabis meals you can think of. And um, when I think of that <laughs> description, I think of you. <laughs> Regardless of anything that's happened in the last couple of months, that is you. You yeah. love posting Instagrams from some of the finest restaurants in this in this town. Of course, you are the concentrates <laughs> guy. So, so is that the general thrust where weed meets food, but with an emphasis on the food? Yeah, I mean, we, we want you know we wanted the chefs to be able to come in and do their thing. We didn't want them to be worried about how they were going to really make this work. That was my job. So I tried to take that off of them um, so they can just come in and make the best food they could think of and then I would have to come up with how how to make it work with their food without taking over the flavor without without losing the good qualities of what they're trying to do yeah, um, sure. which was a challenge and especially because our schedule was super tight very short notice um, mm. so we were planning most of those meals with you know 48 hours or less notice um, wow. meeting the chefs less than 24 hours before we <laughs> cooked um, <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> well, it's good to know that we're not the only procrastinators here at the <laughs> Cannabis yeah. Show, you know, making a TV show, yeah. or you and I were, of course, a part of Rolling Papers, which was a blast yeah. in its own <laughs> experience. Uh, I do want you to relay an anecdote that you shared when you wrote about, uh, you mm -hmm. know, being a part of this Bong Appetit family, um, the pantry. Tell us yeah. about this pantry. Most of our reader, uh, readers, listeners, viewers don't know about the pantry yet. So, so tell them what they have to look forward to when they tune in on Wednesdays. Yeah, we uh, yeah we started referring to it simply as the pantry for <laughs> sure because it's it's a singular <laughs> creation. So, um, basically, what we did we worked with a lot of our friends from in California who are some of the best producers um, in the area, and we filled this literal pantry of a mansion, you know, a nice, a nice full pantry. We filled it with, you know, 30 plus strains of cannabis, um, you know, in big giant jars <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, you know, f uh, 40 plus different types of concentrate. We had like temple balls made by Frenchie Cannoli, which is, you know, he's a super special guy. He's been doing that for 30 years. Um, we had, you know, all, all this amazing live resin, just everything you can think of. We had distillate, crystal, every, ev literally every cannabis product that we could source, uh, we had in there. Um, we had some prepared products like pre-infused honeys and coffees and teas and chocolates. And um, so it, it, was, it was just a great palette to have a chef come in and see, because um, they immediately got excited by it and immediately wanted to explore basically everything. Um, and with most of the meals we did, I mean, we used a, a point out of every part of that pantry in almost all the meals. So. Did you have anything <laughs> to do with the building of that pantry? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, me and my, my friend uh, Jason Pinsky were, were running around doing most of that because um, we, we were the ones with the weed connections. Um, you know, so <laughs> sure. we, we, we knew the right people to call. We knew the, you know, uh, we were able to use, I guess, our, our influence or our credibility or whatever to get, you know, to get the product into the set. Um, and, and yeah, it was pretty amazing. I mean, seeing the chef's eyes when they open the pantry kind of says it all. And we, they tried to capture that moment on the show. So I think you'll, you know, and the viewers will get a pretty good idea of what, that, what that's like. <laughs> It is so cool. I've only seen one of the episodes so far, but I'm a fan, and I will continue to watch. It's already on the DVR. Cool. But uh, you helped create some insane confections, some legit insane confections yeah. for the show. <laughs> so I want to know what you think the craziest thing you guys did while trying to go to extreme lengths to pair these two uh, things, <laughs> food and, and, and weed. Um, wow. I mean, I'm, I'm like struggling to even think of all the things that we did because we, we did, I mean, you know, each meal was at least three different dishes or items and we would infuse each of those two to five different ways, you know, um, whether it's flavor, whether it's texture, just all these different things. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that is in the first episode, which I thought was super inventive and just really, really delicious was the ice cream that Marcel Vineron made. Um, it was, I mean, first of all, it tasted like Fruit Loops, like in a crazy uncanny way. You, it's, oh, wow. it's like turmeric and uh, uh, lemongrass and black pepper, and you put those things together and somehow it tasted like Fruit Loops. I don't know, don't ask wow, me. Sure. Um, okay. So it was just amazing ice cream 
cream that he made with liquid nitrogen, and then he did, um, we juiced cannabis leaves and then made like dipping dots out of them with liquid nitrogen. Um, so it was this amazing, you know, this bright, sweet ice cream with these kind of, this kind of bitter, cool element from the, mm -hmm. the dipping dots. And um, I mean, I, I, I dream about that ice cream every day. It's so good. <laughs> um, I dream about it. And I'm yeah. just watching you guys eat it. Yeah. But tell me this, because I, I loved how the dipping dots, when you guys first tasted the mm -hmm. cannabis leaf juice, uh, one, that's not psychoactive, right? It Correct. hasn't been, so it's non-psychoactive, but also Marcel was like, uh, it's kind of too bitter, so didn't he add some honey to it and then yeah. then go for it? I loved that element of we th we still have to be uh, responsible for how this is going to taste. Yeah, and, and that was the that was one of the coolest things is, I mean, we were experimenting. I mean, the whole thing was improvisational for the most part. We would We would talk to the chefs for, you know, an hour the day before we put the meal together to just kind of get a basic sketch. Then they would show up and we would literally make it up for the next six hours that we were cooking um, with the cameras there. Oh, um, so it was it was super unique. We, it was it was experimental. I mean, fortunately, most of the experiments worked. Um, I mean, <laughs> we made uh, we made andouille sausage that was infused in five different ways, um, and we did that and we cooked that over an open fire in Joshua Tree. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, this amazing guy built like this rough life, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> he built like this crazy like Francis Mallman kind of like charcoal grill pit and and roasted you know a leg of lamb and all this amazing or sorry it's, it was a pork shank actually is what that one was um, pork shank and we made the sausage and it was pretty incredible stuff you know that sounds um, wonderful but let's go for <laughs> one more what's the second craziest thing you guys did for, uh, beyond the ice cream because I know there were a number of things that blew my mind when you first <laughs> wrote about them. Um, well, I mean, maybe my favorite one was the Korean fried chicken, um, which we we brined in a CBD solution. We we came across some water soluble CBD product in California, um, which mm. was combined. It's like CBD distillate combined with some agent that allows it to dissolve. Like you shake it up in a bottle of water and it dissolves. Okay, um, it's super cool. So we we made a brine with that and and uh, got the chicken in that, and then we made just incredible incredible Korean fried chicken um, that was then tossed in like a chili keef CBD crystal flour, <laughs> you know, spice blend. And it was, I couldn't stop eating it. I ate so much of that chicken. <laughs> yeah. Who let you loose in the kitchen, man? <laughs> also, this weed budget yeah. must have been impressive. I mean, it, it was, uh, I mean, fortunately, it, you know, we were kind of gifted a lot of that stuff um, sure. because, you know, the, uh, you know, we, we our, our friends just wanted to share and they wanted to be a part of the experience, you know, and they wanted to see their product used by these amazing chefs in, in these inventive ways. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was super cool. I mean, we were having amazing products thrown at us that we were able to then cook with the next day um, cool. it was it was really inspiring yeah well uh, one last thing before we bring out our next guest I uh, one thing I liked about what you said earlier is that it really was a kind of guided journey and you mm -hmm. start here obviously you want to start with something psychoactive so it gets that night kick started yeah. but then you don't you can't keep piling it on and you very conscientiously at one point in in the pilot brought on in the middle of a pretty a beautiful meal some sort of uh, in CBD intensive dish along with the understanding that this could help mellow people out before a strong finish. Can you talk a little bit about that? Was that part of your plan uh, through this entire process? And how true is that? Do, do we know that CBD does really bring us down from the high? Well, so, I mean, we, we do know that chemically CBD has an antagonistic effect on THC. So um, that's the reason why if, if somebody gets fed like la pure lab grade THC, it's usually a very unpleasant experience. It's usually very anxious, very kind of heart racy. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's why in the natural plant, there's usually other components. Um, so whether it's terpenes or CBD, um, they work sometimes to amplify the effect, but generally to round it out and, and make it make it more palatable to people. Okay. So, um, I mean, when, when I went into this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not an edible chef. That's one of the things that when I, when I came into this, it was like, you're gonna be doing a bunch of infusions. I know scientifically how to do the infusions. I haven't physically done a lot of those infusions. Um, so going into it, I wasn't really thinking about it that way, but we very quickly realized that we're bringing in these guests who have way varying levels of cannabis, you know, tolerance and, um, you know, and edibles are notorious for affecting people in sort of drastic ways that they don't expect. Um, so we try to be very conscious about it. We try to keep most of the meals at 25 milligrams THC total um, oh, or less. Wow. Yeah, really? very, very small. Yeah. Not including the dabs and the, <laughs> and the joints <laughs> and the pipes Correct. that are being passed around. Yeah, and, and that, was part of the, that's, that was part of the reason we did a couple of the early dinners and we had people show up and hang out at the house and uh, the, the set's like a, a mansion, you know, 
know, so we would have people over and basically have kind of a party, well, before the party. Um, so people would come over and and smoke, you know, we'd smoke 10 joints or something standing around, and then by the time they sit down at the table, they're all kind of dead-eyed and tired, and oh, now sure. they're going to start eating edibles, you know. So we, after... What could go wrong? <laughs> the, the first episode we recorded is the taco episode, so if people see that that may be evident <laughs> that sure. the guests were kind of quiet and you know a little high so um, we tried to dial it back a little bit and we tried to m consciously make a lot of CBD food um, both because CBD is healthy and it's great to consume um, and we wanted to emphasize that as much as possible that this is something that people can implement into their diet and not be high all day and not have psychoactive effects and just have beneficial effects. Sure. Um, so we, we tried to, I, I guess we tried to have the CBD as the base of the pyramid and then we would build with terpenes and THC. You know, the THC would be kind of the top, smallest part. Oh, I loved the, the, the terpene <laughs> dropper. What was that, the terpene concentrates or? Um, yeah, so we had, we had some beautiful uh, lo uh, Evo Lab terpenes. Um, they're a local company here. Um, and we, we dripped them, uh, on the first episode, we dripped them onto uh, smoked um, tuna crudo. Um, that was smoked with some J1 flower smoke, and then we dripped Blue Dream terpenes onto it. And it's, man, it's super incredible what one single drop of terpenes will do to food. I mean, you, you eat the tuna, and then as you exhale, you can, your whole head fills with Blue Dream <laughs> flavor. It's really crazy. It's really unique. i got to break but. the fourth wall. Do you know if it was Evo Lab, uh, Brad? I'm talking to our GM yes. uh, w that, that handed us those terpenes in San Francisco. Oh, that might have been. I wonder uh, who the hell was that? That was Guild Extracts. Oh, my okay. God. Yeah, they do good work. Yeah, too. You're, you're right. This guy came along at one point and said, hey, I like the show. And he put like this little dropper <laughs> in my pocket. And I was like, thanks. And I opened it. I was like, oh, my God. Finally found that dude later. Yeah, yeah terpenes. Uh, They're amazing, amazing. amazing stuff. Dude, so fun. <laughs> I cannot wait to see the taco episode. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Thanks, man. We're going to talk to you some more here in a few minutes. Cool. Uh, but now I want to bring uh, out our very own Indica editor, and of course that's Professor Pat, for this week's entry in the new Cannabis Lexicon. You're welcome, Ricardo. Doobie, also see joint. This term is primarily reserved for old hippies, folks over the age of 50 and undercover police officers posing as high school students. As in, quote, hey there, my dude bro, do you want to go smoke some doobie of marijuana? Thank you for that, Professor Pat. Now, let's bring out our next guest who is a re uh, leading retail guru in the cannabis industry. Uh, please help me in welcoming Greg Schoenfeld from BDS Analytics to the Cannabis Show. Hey, hey. good to hey, see you. Hey, Ricardo. Again, nice to see you. Yeah, hey, absolutely. Right. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We met briefly in Vegas, as you just told me before we started taping, but man, we, let, we met late one night, so. I apologize. For you know, that. fuzzy memories are uh, acceptable and <laughs> understandable for all of us. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was the night after the can the second annual Cannabis Awards, uh, the MJ Biz, uh, whatever fifth or sixth annual conference. That was just insanity. But craziest show I've ever been to. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I've never seen crowds like that. Yeah, that was intense. That was wild. Uh, Greg, we ask everybody the same question to start things off. Indica sativa, where are you at? Yes. Yes. I, li I like them. <laughs> Good, answer. Uh, Good answer. All right. That was so well said that we could just move on, unless you want to elaborate. No, let's leave it at that. All right. I like it. Uh, Greg, before, uh, before we talk about where you're at, which is really interesting, and we've had your colleague Roy in here on the show a couple times, I first want to uh, talk about where you've been, because you spent more than a decade working for Leisure Trends, and that's a top analytics firm in the outdoor recreation industry. Give me a brief example of what that work was like, you know, working with sports equipment and all that. And, uh, and then also tell us how, you, how it led you to working in a similar space, but, you know, kind of analyzing cannabis instead. Yeah, Leisure Trends was, uh, it was a passion project. It was a love of my life. I got to work with retailers in the sporting goods industry, really outdoor stores, ski shops, bike shops, oh, run fun. stores across the country. And you're living in Boulder, Colorado, so it life is pretty damn good. The place to do it. Great. So uh, much like BDS Analytics, we took point of sale data and we developed uh, reporting on what was selling in the market. 
and we help the retailers really understand their merchandise mix and identify opportunities for growing their business. We also use that information to help some of the manufacturers that we're supplying their stores, so Patagonia, North Face, uh, Trek, and Specialized Bikes. Those were types of brands that we were helping, and then the retailers could be the mom and pop shop down the street from where you live, or the REIs and sports authorities of the world, and that was that was a really great project. Uh, That's cool, and you were there for a long time, so you must have seen uh, a really interesting period in terms of growth and then other categories maybe falling off at the same time. Yeah, we saw both new categories, new brands emerge. We also saw uh, something that this industry doesn't contend with, which was the, uh, the changes brought about by online sales and how sure. that really uh, rewrote the book for those industries. Oh wow, that must have entirely. So, so how did doing that prepare you to do the same thing but for cannabis, since this industry presents its own challenges as you just tipped off to? Well, I worked with hundreds, maybe thousands of retailers from across the country, independently owned businesses oftentimes. Uh, I'd like to fancy myself a professional cat wrangler. <laughs> and that really uh, set me up for coming into the cannabis space. Sure. Uh, at the end of the day, this is still retail. Um, I thought that the outdoor industry, sporting goods industry was great because uh, we were really contributing to the health and wellness of the people that were consuming the product, even if that product was a durable good. Uh, but in cannabis, I, I think that we're really contributing to the health and wellness of the consumer. So uh, I think that there's a direct correlation between the two. That's a crazy link, but you're, you're right. I mean, you're going from something that uh, is a form of exercise oftentimes to something that is a form of medicine oftentimes. So I like, the, I like your link there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we were just talking, Vince and I, about Colorado's October pot sales numbers. I know you're very familiar with the data because this is what you guys deal in. Um, you know, but here we are in December, and as you know, uh, as we've learned from the past two years of recreation, rec 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 recreation sales here in Colorado and elsewhere. <laughs> December is a monster month for marijuana sales. I want to know why though because is it just us preparing for the holiday parties which I am preparing for by the way. <laughs> I, I need to make a, sh a trip to the pot <laughs> shop or is it something else? Why is December such a mammoth month for marijuana? Yeah I think there's absolutely a lot of things that are going on whether people are getting their work bonuses and have a little extra cash to burn. Uh, sure. You know, the in-laws might be coming into town. You need a little <laughs> extra medicine to get you through the holidays. Um, and also just people, uh, they have a little bit more time off of work. And so uh, if they're not working as much, they have more time to do some of the things that they really uh, enjoy in their free time. So that's great for cannabis. And then finally in Colorado here, uh, you know, it's really the, the kickoff in earnest for the, uh, the ski industry. And so sure. you have a lot of tourists coming in from out of state at that time of year. So uh, I think that was four things. It's more than a trifecta, but that's a whole lot of uh, <laughs> contributing factors to a strong December. Hashtag quadfecta. Quad I don't I like it. think that's a word, but <laughs> we'll use it anyway. No, it's, and it's true because when you think about it, like I, don't, I, I typically don't take time off during December, but you automatically get Christmas and New Year's off, and so uh, most of us do at least, and that, that's more time off than your average month, plus a lot of people do take that week between Christmas and New Year's off to spend it with the family or go out of town or whatever, so that's an interesting outlook. Um, Oh man, this episode has me extremely excited for the holidays. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes, some more time off, please. Um, you know, but since m much of our viewership and our listenership is uh, inside the marijuana industry, I'm wondering if you have any advice for them as they approach this very busy holiday, you know, but um, what advice can you give to these businesses <clears throat> to make the most of the season, whether it's displays, promotions, or seasonal products or, or something else? Yeah, there's so many things that we can do in this space, and that's what's really um, so much fun about being in this industry at such an early stage. Uh, in the years past, 2014, 2015, Christmas was still a relatively small period of time. Uh, sales are only slightly larger than other points of the year. Uh, it's not like other retail industries at this point, but that's quickly changing. Um, 
cannabis is being more widely accepted across the country with different age groups. And so uh, the huge opportunity is to um, both stock and promote and educate customers on different types of products that are available in your stores. And if you want to think about it as um, lighter or novice consumers, uh, are really going to contribute more to the growth of the industry in the future, whereas those people that are heavy consumers have already been contributing to this industry. Sure. So uh, I think that there's always a huge opportunity with uh, props like microdose products uh, that are more palatable to novices. Um, edibles, pre-rolled joints, those are always great at this time of year. Those entry points that if you're walking into a shop for the first or second time, you're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to be afraid of it. You're, you're, it's, you find it approachable because it's 2.5 milligrams in an edible instead of 10. Exactly. I mean, you know, if your grandparents are in town and they've got arthritis, you're probably not going to want to give them a big, heavy dose. But maybe you could start grandma off with something light. <laughs> so long as grandma knows, you're not just slipping it in her tea or anything. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have direct experience with family members who have tried 10 milligrams of an edible, and it's been too much. And, and now I feel bad that I started them there or encouraged them to start there. It was in my earlier days in this position, and I just didn't know as much. And now if I have that conversation with anybody, it's like, okay, thankfully there are these new products out, and it's been lab tested. That is 2.5. That is 5 milligrams. And I think that's a good point, that it, the more education they do around those products, and also the more products like that that are available on the market, um, the better these Decembers could end up being for, for sales and taxes. Exactly. And the other point that I'd also bring up is that a lot of the purchasing that takes place around the holidays is people buying for themselves. You can't always count on someone else getting you the gift that you want. And while you're out there, <laughs> you're going to make sure you're going to get it one way or another. And so um, your frequent shoppers are probably going to stop into your store during the holidays. And if there's specials, uh, they might really take it advantage of them. And it's a great opportunity to perhaps introduce your customers to a product that's a little bit different than something they've tried in the past. So if you know your customers, uh, you know, if you're a bud tender and you have a relationship with mm -hmm. your clientele, uh, it's a good time to maybe suggest some new products. That's a good point. Plus, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's small. It comes in a small package. And whether you're getting gourmet coffee or dark chocolate or maybe those little booze bottles, the shooters, <laughs> or weed in your stocking, you know, this stuff fits in a stocking, people. This is a great stocking stuff for everybody <laughs> listening right now. I want weed in my stocking for Christmas, please. <laughs> <laughs> Consider it done, producer Vince. Uh, I want to bring Rye back into the conversation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited talking about the holidays. We finally got some decorations up at the house, but yep. we're also nearing the end of the year. And I want to ask each of you uh, to come up with a, a New Year's resolution of sorts for legal cannabis in America and beyond. So basically what I want to know from each of you, starting with Rye, what's the one facet of legal marijuana uh, that you'd like to see worked out in 2017? Um, I Honestly, probably the testing industry. I, I feel oh, yes. like I feel like there's the most amount of regulatory work to do there and and oversight needed there. Um, just because literally every business, at least in Colorado, is subject to the testing labs, whether or not they can release a product, whether or not they're using you know, uh, 0.75 grams of concentrate versus one gram of concentrate in order to get to X potency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the fact is is that they all use different standards. Um, they use different equipment. They have people who may or may not be trained to actually operate that equipment on a high level and certainly not interpret those results. Um, and so I, I, I'm just of the mind that until the state steps in and says, okay, we're sending everything to CSU's you know, nuclear magnetic resonance lab or sure. something like that, then it's just going to continue to be businesses sort of held hostage by other businesses who <laughs> are, are not necessarily doing everything up to the standards that you would see in other agricultural testing industries. And it's amazing, because um, here we are, I'm uh, three years into sales, four years into legalization, and 
and there are still no state certified certifications for pesticide testing in Colorado and then the other ones as you mentioned there there is some variance there if you're going from lab to lab mm -hmm. have you been paying attention to what's been happening in Oregon with the with the new pesticide testing regulations and how that's really uh, really held back the concentrates industry. I know you're passionate about yeah. extracts, so what do you think about what's happening in Oregon? Are they too strict? Are they just right and the industry just has to work to make it happen? Or I mean, I, I think it makes sense. I think they're, they're right in intention. Um, maybe the execution of it and the timing of it may not have been good for the industry, certainly, but um, it, you know, I mean, the fact is, if without labs that are able to do that kind of testing capably in high volume for all of these clients, that's just going to be an issue. So um, I, I think that the intent of removing pesticides from cannabis is great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that states need to be conscious and they need to be made aware and regulators need to be awa made aware of the intricacies of this sort of process where testing labs can't just take in the entire state's you know, every strain that they, every batch that they harvest in the entire state of cannabis. That's just, these labs aren't built for that. Um, so most of the labs that are in play are existing agricultural testing labs and that sort of thing. They have to completely learn a new thing. Um, if they've been testing alfalfa grass for 30 years, that's doesn't really apply that much to testing cannabis. So um, they, they need to source standards, they need to do all this sort of stuff. And so I, I, think it's, I think it's a little bit hasty and it's unfortunate for the producers there because I think most of them are trying to produce a good product. Um, but for the consumer, I think it's good. You know, I think it's, I think it's good to know. So that. if your, your weed New Year's resolution is figuring out testing in 2017, who do you think that primarily rests on? The regulators, the labs, um, some a combination, somebody else. I mean, you know, industry policing itself always is sort of a dangerous thing. Um, so I think like the idea of the labs coming together as some sort of a, a coalition or whatever and coming up with standards, this, that, and the other, is is great if everybody honors that. But as we know, people will sometimes make agreements and then see that they can get a competitive advantage by not following that agreement. Sure. So, you know, there, I, I think that's messy and I think ultimately the state of Colorado or the state of California or any of these other localities um, needs to make the hard call and say, we're taking this in, we're taking this on. And, you know, they need the funding, they need the people, they need the infrastructure, the logistics, it's a huge security risk, all this sort of stuff has to be taken into consideration. So, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, I think, I think it has to be the states. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, whoever's regulating these programs has to step in and say, these are, these are the labs that are approved because they meet this very specific standard, mm -hmm. not this very general standard, which is what we have in Colorado. So we're looking at departments of uh, revenue, agriculture, and health. All right, Greg, mm -hmm. uh, if you had one marijuana uh, New Year's resolution for 2017, what is it? Well, as being a, a resource for the business community, I'm, uh, I'm always interested in, in seeing this market become more legitimatized. Obviously, the elections in November showed how much uh, momentum cannabis has across the country, but at a federal level, there's uh, as many question marks, if not more, than ever. And, uh, you know, 280E, so taxation and banking are still really holding back uh, growth at a national level and even within some of the states. So, um, you know, it's not so much a resolution. I have very little control over this, but that's my <laughs> wish is to, um, to see a little bit more clarity and acceptance that this industry is here to stay. The cat's out of the bag. Now let's bring it into the mainstream and let these businesses operate like any other business. And specifically, you're talking about legitimacy at a federal level, not just Colorado, cool, California, cool. You want to see some movement made at this federal level. Absolutely. You know, this is, uh, it's been an experiment in Colorado and <laughs> other states. They're expanding it. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the sky hasn't fallen. Um, Colorado is a booming economy in this state. I think it's really an example of uh, how to implement an industry correctly. And that doesn't mean we haven't hit some hiccups along the way. Uh, but the industry and the state have gotten together. They've worked their way through the situations and they continue to do so. And um, I think that the federal government should look at that and should wholeheartedly embrace it.
and IRS code 280E is a very, uh, you know, we're, our listeners are very familiar with that. We had a, a talented tax attorney on the show a couple months ago who does a lot of work with cannabis businesses, and, and he he has the feeling that it really is the IRS's grudge against uh, this industry because if they wanted to lift that, they could. I, I, but they haven't, even though the sky hasn't fallen, even though we're four years into this experiment. So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we will see some change on this, but at the same time, we are entering uh, a kind of unknown 2017 under Trump and potentially Sessions and, yeah. Unknown is always scary <laughs> for business, but, uh, you know, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. It's uh, the polling at the national level shows a lot of acceptance. Uh, it's More kind than of ever. a bipartisan uh, issue or support across the nation. So, um, you know, the politicians should listen up and recognize that this is what their constituents want. You know, I want to I want to bring Rye back in. Uh, how fascinating would it be if we're exiting a first Trump uh, residency, uh, four years term? Um, and and mar we and at the end of that term, marijuana has actually made tremendous leaps and bounds at the federal level. I mean, this is not the presidential candidate the industry wanted for the most part, but this is the the, the candidate and the future president that they have. Is there any chance that we're at the end of this first term and uh, suddenly we're like, oh, well, that wasn't so bad for the industry, right? What do you think? I mean, I, I think the potential's there. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people have sort of made this argument about about Trump that you know his his previous beliefs and public statements have been more friendly towards cannabis, more friendly towards states' rights, and that sort of thing. Um, so, I, and, and you know, ultimately, he's he's an industry person. He's a businessman, whatever. Um, so, I, I think that if there's you know a, a, a literal billion dollar industry, as the proof is in Colorado, and if Cal, you know, in California in 2018 or whenever they actually get fully going, I mean, just saying no to that amount of money, tax revenue, jobs, all that sort of stuff seems so grossly unpopular to me. I can't imagine that he's going to just roll it back in any substantial way. Um, sure. E e sessions or no sessions, I just I don't I don't think that's going to be popular at all. Yeah. Greg, what um, do you think? Is there a chance that 4 years from now we're going to be like, oh, the marijuana industry just made more uh, federal progress than it did under 8 years of Obama? You think that's very likely? There's always a chance, you know. We we've <laughs> You're gotten past the hope. <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten past inertia. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs that are being supported by this industry. It's not just at the dispensaries and the cultivators and the brands. It's in ancillary services like BDS analytics. You know, we hire, we employ 20 people in three states now. Wow. Um, so, you know, this industry is really contributing a lot of impact, positive impact to the country and I really don't think that politicians are going to shut down an industry that supports hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions in revenue and soon to be billions in tax revenue. Sure. Uh, it's a it's a fun idea, especially since we don't know who the next attorney general is. Yeah. We we know who's nominated, and 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 gosh, if we're high, if if we're if we're guessing about that, why wouldn't we guess four years from now and uh, and and then throw it into a different uh, paradigm? Because who knows? Uh, but gentlemen, it is time for the pot quiz. Let's see how each of you do. This is current events. This is current marijuana events. Right, we're starting with you. This is how it works. If he gets the answer wrong, you have the potential for a steal, vice versa. So, Rye Pritchard, are you ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> what would be the minimum age to purchase cannabis in Canada if the federal government's marijuana legalization task force's recommendation is accepted? So I, I feel like it's 21, but I actually missed this news story, and I feel like maybe it's not that, because that seems like the obvious answer, so I'm going to say 25. 25 is your answer, and that is wrong. Oh. And, uh, you know, the viewers and listeners right now have a little bit of an advantage over you guys, because this is something that Alicia covered in the quick hit, so... Just don't worry, we're not giving them the answers. They do not know, and uh, 25 is not the right answer. Greg, for the steal. Wild guess, 19. 
Man, I think we have to give you a point because it's going to probably potentially be 19 in some of the provinces, but 18 in a majority of the oh, provinces. All right. Well. And at least that's what's <laughs> being put out there by this task force. You know, these are only recommendations and we'll see what ultimately gets accepted. But um, learning from how the provinces have governed alcohol regulation, yeah. it is 18 for the most part and then a couple with 19. So, point. Makes all sense. right. So let's <laughs> do it. Greg, you ready for the next question? Bring it. Fiscal analysts estimate that Canada's legal marijuana market could total how much by 2021? A, 2.8 billion, B, 4.5 billion, C, 5.9 billion, D, 6.7 billion dollars. Canadian dollars or American dollars? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're similar these days. We were at parody a couple of years ago. Um, my guess is American dollars. I'm gonna but good guess. I mean, good, good question. I'm going to go with 5.9 billion. 5.9 billion C. That is not correct. For the steel rye, A is 2.8 billion, B, 4.5 billion, or D, 6.7 billion. I'm gonna go big. Canada smokes a lot of weed. Let's go. Let's go D. <laughs> Canada does, does smoke a lot of weed, but no, that's ah, also wrong. <laughs> it was B, 4.5 billion dollars. That's what they, uh, these fiscal analysts estimate that Canada's legal marijuana market will be in just five years from now. Come on, Canada, get your weight up. Get to, get to that. D <laughs> hey, answer. not everybody has your <laughs> mythic tolerance, right? <laughs> uh, all right, right. The next question is for you. So. Name the former NBA All-Star who played in Boston, Toronto, Denver, Minnesota, Detroit, New York, and Los Angeles, and he's now an ESPN commentator who said recently that he wanted, he actually wanted some of his former teammates to smoke weed before the games, quote, it helped them focus on the game plan. I believe that was Mr. Chauncey Billups. Oh, ding, <laughs> yes, that is a point. Mr. Chauncey Billups, Denver reared. Denver's own, Park yeah. Hill. Yep. All right, well, great, great work. Um, I think we're at a, what, what one to one, given the steal? It's, it's one to one ish if we yeah. give that, that, that <laughs> oh, point yeah. from the first question that was really just always round up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving them it. 18 or 19 works. Um, but, Greg, final question. Name one of the NBA coaches slash executives who recently admitted to consuming cannabis while recovering from back surgery. There were multiple, but if you can name one of them, you get the point. I think the cotton mouth is setting in. <laughs> I can't open the mouth. <laughs> Why do you think? I'll say this might be our first two basketball questions back to back. I love it. I love it. Show, man. <laughs> right, so are you, are you a fan? Pumped. I love basketball. I didn't it's know you were a fan. Yeah. Oh, shit. It's the only sport great. I give a crap about. You might be in trouble here. I, I think Rye's stepping in for the steal <laughs> on this one. Any ideas? You want to throw out an idea first, Greg, or no? Nope. I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Can you Word. name a single NBA coach? <laughs> <laughs> I could not before this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I could. Well, isn't Jordan a coach? No, Michael nope. Jordan? he's just an He's owner. an owner. owner okay. of the Bob, or the, uh, yeah, points. I don't know what's going nope, on. No, it's easier to name the owners. Okay, so <laughs> Rye for the steal and the potential win. Uh, I'll name both of them. It was Steve Kerr and Phil Jackson. Oh, a definitive, <laughs> definitive <laughs> victory here. <laughs> Well done, guys. I had no idea Rye was a big basketball fan, so I apologize. <laughs> the questions were loaded. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> it, was, it was rigged. The whole way it was rigged. I know, but Greg, you're, the, you're a big Canada fan. So we went to Canada to... No, I don't know. Are you a big Canada fan? I like the cold. <laughs> I like maple syrup. I like the trailer park boys, so maybe... <laughs> Well, if you like the cold, enjoy the next couple months. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I want to thank my guests, Rye Pritchard and Greg Schoenfeld. But most importantly, thank you guys. We really appreciate you watching and listening to The Cannabis Show very much. Thanks for reading The Cannabis. Thanks for telling your friends all about it. Uh, I'm Ricardo Baca here with producers Vince and everybody else. Don's in the house. Katie was in the house earlier. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. Good night. 
I'm allowed to lose, I choose to win, I'm all in, I'm calling any pot so you'll be raising at the end, I say it again, ain't afraid to get in, I'll be going for the jackpot with aces in my hand, I'm raw.